Father, thank you for your word, and I thank you again for the subject we're studying. And uh, Lord, we know that when we talk about things of the spirit realm, that there's an element of mystery that we don't understand. And what we do understand, we understand from your word. We pray that you would help us to understand, Lord, as we put the scriptures together. Uh, help us to have uh, the revelation that we need about this. And uh, we ask this of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we have covered, as we've been talking about angelology, we have covered their origin, nature, status, and uh, their appearance. Um, how they appear a lot of times in the human form and uh, how they're both invisible and but God allows people to see them sometimes. Sometimes they actually appear as a physical human person, though that it is just an appearance. They are not flesh and blood when that happens. Um, and we talked about all that in the last few weeks. So now we're moving into their capacities and power. And uh, we're going to talk about how they... Uh, or represented as, as a personal being. Our first passage is Revelation 22. So let's let's turn there and we'll look at verse 8 and 9. And... How they are personal beings that we can interact with. Would somebody like to read verse 8 and 9 of chapter 22? I got it. Okay. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard them and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So, what we're getting here uh, is we're, we're learning about how an angels are, are personal and they interact with us. And what is the interaction that we see going on in this passage between John the Apostle, mm -hmm. John the Revelator, and this angel? He goes to bow in front of him. He goes to bow down before him because he's such a brilliant figure, right? John the Apostle, he loses sight of... Don't worship angels, right? And he bows down because this creature is so brilliant. Um, what is the angel's response? Don't do that. Don't, Don't do that, that right? Yeah. You only worship God. Uh, he, he's, he's having a conversation and he's interacting with John. He's like, hold on just a minute. Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours. So he, he says, you know, yes, am I a different being? I'm a different being. We talked about that when we talked about their origin, that angels are not humans. They're, they didn't come from humans. They are a created species that are spirit beings separate from mankind. They are not children of Adam or anything like that. But we're learning about them, that they are spirit beings. They are servants of God. And this passage is not necessarily talking about how they're a servant and all that. I mean, it is, but what we're looking at is how... Uh, these are personal beings that interact with us and have that capability. Um, so we're, in, in studying this, we're learning about what they're like, that they can have a conversation with us, relate to us, um, and in some ways identify with us and say, look, I'm like you and in the sense that we're all servants of the Creator. I'm a created being. You're a created being. Even if we're not the same, don't worship me. Only worship God, right? So let's move on now. We're going to look at uh, some verses that talk about how they are moral creatures. We're going to look at five that talk about how they're moral creatures that are uh, holy or good angels. And then we'll look at a couple of them that show their moralness as a fallen angel. Uh, the, those that we would classify as demons. So uh, I'm going to, since we're going to do a whole category here of these five, let me hand these out to you. Would someone like to read Matthew 25, 31? I'll read that. All right, Aaron. And how about Mark 8, 38? Okay. All right, Frank. You want it? Yeah. All right, then Luke 126, you got it. Okay. I'll do Acts 10, 22. Acts 10, 22. Mark, and then Revelation 14, 10. All right. 
deal. Let's read these and look at how they are moral creatures. This is a great subject. Matthew 25, 31 is our first one. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels bear Him, He will sit on the glorious throne. All right. So we're looking at how these are good angels. These are angels that are come, going to come back with Him in glory. And these are His angels. These are not the fallen ones. There's not a whole lot in this one. A whole lot of good meat in the sense that we're the next one you look at. You're going to see a little bit more. Um, uh, but what we're looking at is how an angel can be. When we, when we say that they are moral, what we're talking about there is that they can uh, do good or evil, right? And so, um, and we know that from the fall that they had a choice at one time. They were all created by God. They were all created as his servants. But Satan, one of his created good, holy angels, sinned with pride and fell. And we'll get into all of that in, later on. Um, but it showed that they had a choice. And even their worship uh, is a choice. Uh, they're, not, they're not little um, computer chipped robots that just say holy, holy, holy because God likes the sound of that. They are beings, real spirit beings that really truly are worshiping out of a choice and out of love for God. And uh, otherwise it's not real worship. Even in heaven, it's not real worship. So you, you can't have any being there worshiping and it not have the free choice to be able to. And we, we, we get all of that when we look at all of Scripture that some fell away because they have the ability. They are moral beings. Let's go to Mark 8, 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Okay, so thank you, Frank. The part we're listening for there is when he comes in his glory with his holy angels. So Matthew didn't say holy angels, but it talks about him coming back with his angels in glory. And, and, and the Mark passage says that they are his holy angels. They are the angels set apart for him. They're holy. Remember that word when we studied it in, in our theology class months ago. It means to be set apart for God's use. It also has the, uh, the meaning of purity. And uh, so these angels are both gods and they are pure and righteous. Um, let's go on now to Luke 126. I think Dad had that one. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. All right. So on this one, it doesn't say they're good, doesn't say they're holy or anything like that, but they're. This angel Gabriel is sent by God. So he's God's angel. He's uh, one of God's messengers. And uh, we know he's there to talk about the coming of, of Jesus. Let's uh, go now to Acts 10.22. And they said Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. All right. Thank you, Mark. So the importance of that, this is not a demon angel that showed up to Cornelius. It's not a fallen angel. It's a holy angel. It's important because in the Bible, we have the fallen angels coming to people too and speaking to them and leading them and tempting them, right? And, and so... You've got a classification of what angel came and talked to Cornelius. It was a holy angel, one of God's angels, a servant of God. Um, so, uh, and our last one is Revelation 14.10 as we look at this section. He too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. All right, thank you. So, that's our last one, but you've, you've seen in those passages, it's either an angel sent by God, like Gabriel here, uh, it's angels coming with him in his glory, the other two in Mark and Acts talk about him being holy, and so uh, in Revelation talk about them being holy angels. So we're just seeing how 
angels are defined as holy angels, and then we'll also see where they're defined as demons or fallen angels or evil spirits. There's a classification difference because of what, uh, because they're moral beings. That's the whole point here. We're talking about there, there are good ones and there are evil ones, but they're all angels. Okay. So what's really weird about that, yes. I'm thinking about that, is, is that a fallen angel, mm -hmm. if John had been before a fallen angel and bowed, he would have, he would have been fine. He would not have corrected him at yeah. all. Yeah, right. he would be fine with, with him bowing. Exactly. Yeah. You, you never hear a demon correct a human for worshiping them. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yes. Um, I, one of the things, I have dreams um, and have for many, many years. Mm -hmm. When Jacob was a baby and I was a single mom, I had a dream one time. I call it my St. Paul dream. But there was a man that came down an escalator in my living room and basically tempted me with all of these things and mm -hmm. said that I could call him Paul. And um, that basically if I would only worship him, that he would give me anything I wanted. That my son and I would never want for anything. Oh. But I knew, and I wasn't a Christian. I didn't know anything. But I knew he was wrong. Mm -hmm. I knew he was evil. And I told him to get out. You know, get out of my, get out of my house. And he went back up this escalator and just told me, if you change your mind, I'm here. Just let me know. Oh. But I knew he was evil. Whoever he was, oh, yeah. that he he told me to worship him. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it was terrifying. Um, I actually woke up. I remember waking up and running into Jacob's bedroom to check on him because yeah. you know that's your first thought, my kids. You yeah. mentioned your son, yeah. so he did. Yeah. He yeah. said you and your son will never walk for anything. Yeah. But anyway, I just thought that was Amen. Good. Yeah, praise God that even before you were a believer in Christ that you had enough discernment to know this is bad. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Amen. Very, very similar to what we find in Scripture, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's the yeah, same story, same devil. He's not changed. <laughs> he wants worship. Yeah. The Old Testament describes those fallen angels uh, as being the false gods that get worshipped, the Baals, uh, the Molechs, and well, so to on. to use a name, mm -hmm. I knew the name. Paul. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to use a name that I yeah. was familiar with right. is just deceptive. Yeah, it's exactly the MO, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we've got that in our day and time, too. Jesus is being used and called God by different false religions and cults, but it's not the same Jesus as the Bible. And, and that's why it's so important to understand theology. It's why I'm glad you're in this class. Because <laughs> you need to know what, how do you define and how do you know that the Jesus you're worshiping is the Jesus of the Bible? Because the Mormons say they worship Jesus too. And Which they, they claim he's the Jesus who died on the cross, was buried, and rose right. again. They claim he's Jesus of Nazareth. They claim he's Jesus who, they claim he's the same one in the Bible. But when you change his origin, when you go and you change and you, when you go and affect all of that by adding to the story of the Bible, you change the Jesus. He's not the Jesus. And the deception is connecting him with the Jesus of the Bible, but you've changed a whole lot. And you have to add this other book to understand all the changes that have been made to that Jesus, that he's no longer the Jesus of the Bible. He really and truly is not. And um, they not only added to his, uh, the before he comes in the Bible, but they added to his after the Bible. So his life has been added to in both realms. They, they've said that he was once a human who got his own planet and worked his way up uh, and, and begot to become a god. So they, they've told the pre, it's kind of like Star Wars when they started with Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi or something like that, right? And then, and then they started going back and doing, well, let's do an episode one. That's what the Mormons have done. <laughs> they've done some episode ones and twos, and then they've said, oh, and let's talk about after. And they've added on and said, you know, then he came to North America, and he ministered among the Indians, and he grew up great cities, beautiful cities all over North America. Sadly, there's no archaeological evidence for any of it, but all the archaeological evidence is still there in the land of Judea, still there. Yeah. Why did it last there for thousands of years, but it couldn't last for 
a thousand years, fifteen hundred years uh, well, here in America. Didn't, didn't so account for all that. yeah, yeah. Well, so when they, he made his laws, he didn't account Bible for archaeology. Bible too, or hmm? do they do they call their Bible their holy Bible? They know what they will do is they 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 have the Bible. And they have the Book of Mormon, and then they have several other books. The uh, Pearl of Great Wisdom, I believe, is what it is. Mm -hmm. They have different books that they add, and um, mm -hmm. and the other thing is they also there whatever prophet they have the prophet who's in office for however many years and, and maybe till he dies. But wow. that prophet has the ability when he speaks, he speaks with the authority of Scripture, so he can change the Book of Mormon, he can change the Bible, he can add to it, he can do whatever he wants. And that's why you look at the Book of Mormon. It's changed and changed and changed since its beginning. And they will snatch up. The Mormons will snatch up. Once they change it, they'll go out and snatch up every book that there is yeah. in the Book of Mormon. Um, it's, you can go to, yeah. That's why you can go to any secondhand bookstore. You won't find them. Um, very seldom yeah. you find a, a Book of Mormon in there yeah. because they, they snatch them up. There's a guy in to cover their to cover what they're doing, yeah. so that it looks like it remained the same. Right. There's a guy in Marlow, Oklahoma, who has a private library a of all yeah. the ancient. I mean, he goes all the way back. He has he has gotten a hold of these things, and he has been offered enormous amounts of money for his library from the Mormons, and he won't sell wow. because he wow. he's you got know, treasure. He, and I yeah. bought books from him when I was up there 20 years ago. Um, because wow. he is, what he has done is he's taken and he's photocopied out of all these and he's put together in huge bindings so that you can see the difference. It's, it's crazy. Awesome. We're we're not supposed to be talking about Mormons. We're talking about <laughs> angels tonight. Yeah. Let's get back to angels. But, um, I don't know how we chased that rabbit, but I could tie it real easy because the Book of Mormon came from an angel that appeared to right. Joseph Smith. Right. He's a fallen angel. <laughs> we gotta, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. And the connection between that and Muhammad getting his from a fallen angel as well, which is where the Quran came from, is crazy. So yeah, we're, we're booked. that'll be for later. We'll get there. All right. So um, we just read. Revelation 14.10. Revelation 14.10. And now we're going to get into, we are going to talk about at least two verses. We're not getting into demonology yet. We're going to get there, I promise. But while we're talking about the fact that they are moral beings, we're at least going to get a couple of them to show that they both can be holy angels. They also can be angels that sin and lie. So let's look at uh, John 8.44. Somebody want to read that one? All right, Bubba. And 1 John 3, 8-10. All right, Charlie. Let's read those two. And... You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding, on to, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. All right. Thank you, Bubba. All right. So right there, we've got to remember, though it's, we're talking about the devil. We can't. We cannot forget that the devil is an angel. He is a fallen angel. He's the prince of demons. Um, he was Lucifer before he was thrown out of heaven because of his pride, and we'll get to his whole story later. But for for the sake of, is our angels moral? Yes. He is a murderer. It says, and he is also he was a murderer from the beginning, and. Uh, when he speaks, he lies. Lying is his native language, right? So he is the father of lies. So we've got here an angel that is a murderer and a liar, and we know the devil's a whole other one that, right? Yeah. But he, it, we're, we're just, for the sake of talking about them being moral creatures, this one fell. He, he had a choice. There was a time when he was not a fallen angel. There was a time when he was a righteous angel before God, and he made a choice to exalt himself to the place of God. And again, we'll go through all this when we talk about him in the future. But it was a moral decision, so they are moral beings. Let's go to 1 John 3, 8 through 10 now. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sounds, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked? You oh, I'm sorry. We're in First John. The, oh, the little sorry. epistle at the back. That's okay. First John. Okay. <laughs> you just didn't hear my first is all. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you claim to be without sin, 
We deceive ourselves and the truth is not with us. How many of you got to read? 13? Yeah. If we confess our sins. Hold on. No. Uh, 1 John 3. Chapter 3. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> First John chapter 3 <laughs> and verse 8 and oh, okay. 8 through Here 10. Go, I think. <laughs> and what? And what? Oh, Lord. Lord, we need a little help over here. <laughs> the one who does what is sinful, sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sin sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's sin seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children. Of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> 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 okay. We got through it. <laughs> All right, so the one who practices sin. Again, what we, we could do a whole sermon out of this. Two verses here. It's a good good little passage. But what we're sticking with here, we're, we're seeing that, again, the Bible shows that the devil, who is a fallen angel, uh, he practices sin, right? Um, he, it, he the, For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The other verse in John 8.44 said the devil was a murderer from the beginning. Uh, first John, he says the devil has sinned from the beginning. All right, so um, we're, that's what we're looking at. He's a moral being. He is a sinner. Uh, he's, done, he's more than a murderer and a liar. He is a sinner all the way around. So, all right. Now let's move on. Uh, we're going to look at the question. The, the, uh, I've got a question mark here. I know y'all can't read this, but superhuman knowledge? Uh, do angels have superhuman knowledge? And I think you're going to see the answer to that is yes. But Matthew 24, 36 is what we're going to look at to to answer that question. But of that day and hour, no one knows. No, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Amen. All right. So, they have superhuman knowledge, but they are limited in their knowledge, right? Uh, he says... Not even the angels in heaven know, nor the Son of Man knows when he will return. Um, they, let's see here, I was going to read it again. Uh, yeah. On that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father alone. Um, so the not even the angels and we know as we're going to see in a, in a minute uh they they do have a limited amount but they they have much more knowledge than we do oftentimes because of uh the way they can collect knowledge and gain knowledge we're going to see that in just a minute let's go on and look at another verse that kind of shows the limited nature of their knowledge and that's first peter 1 12. To read that verse, go ahead. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of these things that have now been told by you, by those who have been preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. All right. Thank you, Carlos. So, even angels long to look into these things. They, they have a limit to their knowledge. Um, it's important, uh, I've got written over here uh, in just a minute, uh, that though they have knowledge, even beyond our knowledge, there is a limit to their knowledge. And we've just seen that in two passages, that uh, though they, they seem to have knowledge 
they, there's a limit to it, like when Christ will return. Um, they could not see Christ's day. They have longed to look into it. Uh, he says, um, those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Right? So we get to experience receiving the Holy Spirit and being adopted as sons and daughters of God. Right? Angels don't get that. They're called sons of God, but not in the same way that we are. All mankind, in one respect, are called children of God because God created us. All right? But in the sense of being adopted and being born again by the Spirit of God, that is something that angels don't get. Only sons of Adam get. Only mankind. Because so, they don't suffer death. They don't suffer death, right? Their spirit beings, they don't die. Um, but in a, our spirit doesn't die either. Our physical body does, exactly. But, but our, uh, if we're born again, we, we live in joy. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we live in, term, uh, in, a, in a terrible condition for the rest of eternity. Um, kind of like the angels suffer. that chose life and, and uh, the other ones who rebelled. Yeah. You, you go on existing. Saying. You go on existing with a conscience. You're, you're not, you don't become unconscious of your suffering. You're, you're very conscious. Mark? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, so I was kind of reminded of a passage in Genesis chapter 18 where um, there is uh, sort of Christ appearing as an angelic being or as mm -hmm. a man, and there's two other angels. Right. Um, and this is whenever um, the Lord begins to engage with Abraham. Mm -hmm. And specifically in passage, uh, let's see, verse 17, it says the Lord said, and we assume that he's speaking with the other angels mm -hmm. that are with him. And he said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. This idea that He's speaking with these other angels about a piece of knowledge that Abraham doesn't even know about. Right. So this idea that maybe they have some sort of knowledge, perhaps, that Abraham doesn't have, or maybe right. they didn't even know whatever right. it was that he was about to do. So right. I just re was reminded of that passage. Yeah, no, that's a good one. We actually looked at that passage last week, but not with that in mind at all. Mm -hmm. So looking at it from the sense of the knowledge they have, I think a lot of times angels, they're giving they're given an assignment from God, they're given information from God, and they're bringing it to us. So they'll have it before we have it because God gave it to them. Mm -hmm. And I think in this situation, you don't see the angel of the Lord, which is a Christophany of Christ. You don't see him telling those two angels, okay guys, <clears throat> we've kept this a secret until now because it's been a need to know basis. But now you can break open the envelope and learn what you're supposed to do. Go down and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They already know the assignment. <clears throat> they know the assignment when they're there. Unless those parts just didn't get recorded. But I think, but the, the thing, the thing the, to remember is, do they have superhuman knowledge? Yes, because they get it from the throne room of God. But they only have the knowledge God gives them. They only have information God gives them. But they will have information that we are not privy to. Yeah. But it's because the Father is giving it to them. And... Uh, and I think the same could be said for us. Um, God gives us through his gifts of the spirit. He gives us words of knowledge. Sometimes he gives prophetic words, dreams. He allows us to see things in the spirit realm that others don't. God allows us to uh, engage in these spiritual realms uh, that otherwise we wouldn't without his spirit. And the gifts of the spirit are clear evidence of that. Um, when he speaks through us, teaches us, gives us understanding of things that we didn't have before he's giving us knowledge in fact uh, one of the prayers that paul prays for the church is his father give them your spirit of wisdom and understanding that they could know you and wisdom and revelation is another way he puts it when he prays for another church so he asked god to to release that and even to understand that jesus is the messiah the son of god the one they should put their faith in that is knowledge given to any one of us so that we understand our need for him and can believe and put our faith in him. 
Yeah, depending on your translation, the psalm says the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Yeah. So that yeah. same idea. Amen. You stay close to him. You, mm -hmm. His spirit has is the mind of God. He knows the heart of God. And if, you're, if we're close to the spirit of God, we're going to be a whole lot more able to hear the heart and mind of God than we will if we're far away from God. So. Well, I just, um, I'm studying the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And in Daniel 7, it struck me as really weird how Daniel had his own vision mm -hmm. and he didn't understand it. Yes. And it freaked him out. Yep. And But while he's having the vision, there's an angel there. Yes. And so he looks at the angel and says, hey, help me out. Can yeah. you explain this for me? And he does. Yep. And I think that's kind of yep. interesting that yep. even for the man that, that's what he does. He he's the one that can explain dreams, but God is so awesome yeah. that he doesn't give Daniel the power to think he can even explain his own yeah. until God says it's this. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I uh, yeah. I almost put uh, a Daniel passage down. I may get to it next week, but on that same note, because angels are given knowledge of even how to interpret a dream. They don't interpret them from their own right. power. They interpret just like Daniel. They well, interpret I, because God gives them. I guess I thought yeah, God's yes. gonna, God knows Daniel's mm -hmm. going to go, wait a minute. This yep. one's got me stumped. Yeah. I haven't had time to pray because it's my own vision. Yeah. And so there's an angel right here. <laughs> yeah. Hey. And I, I just thought that was good. Yeah. Good. Well, and, and Daniel interprets because God gives him the ability to interpret. Joseph the picture he interprets because God gives him the ability. God's the one who gives the interpretation of dreams, whether it's an angel or a human. And I think it's, it's you know, you could say, why did God allow the angel? Well, it's because Daniel asks questions that we get to read because we're all wondering what in the world is this beast with gold and silver and bronze and all this stuff, right? These beasts that you're seeing, what are they? Thankfully, he asked the angel, and the angel says, well, let me explain it to you. And then we get the knowledge of that. that we're talking about, oh, this is a kingdom. Oh, great. I didn't know what that beast was. It's a kingdom and a king. It's both. What? It's a kingdom and a king? Thank you, angel, for telling us that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Why God does what he does, and he works in mysterious ways. <laughs> Freeze y'all down. Let's get a little bit right on. It is warm. <laughs> okay. All right, where were we? We looked at first Peter. Uh, was there any other comments or questions that we on what we were talking about? We don't have to move on if you're talking about angels and Okay. Alright. Let's go to Luke 12, 8. Uh, yeah, this is we're gonna see how they can grow in knowledge. Angels can learn. The collecting information like Big Brother on your phone. Uh, also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. Okay. I'm going to get there myself. And Everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of God, will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So, uh, God will let them know this is one of mine, right? They're not all knowing, remember that. And that's very important. We're learning it about a holy angel right now, but it's very important when we get to demonology that they don't, they are not all knowing. And that it's important right. to both understand that they can learn and watch and learn from what we do and say. It's also important to know that they don't read our mind and they don't know everything about us, but they can learn. So if you're strategizing and you're trying to walk in warfare and walk, you want to understand that those who are after you are looking for evidence to accuse you with, right? I can't go too far on that because I can't jump into demonology, but we're going to get there. I'm just saying, put little footnotes, <laughs> put you a little piece of paper in these things. Because as we talk about the Holy Ones learning, it's also going to play uh, that the, the demons also able to, they do learn, they listen. Um, so 
uh, the way they're, they're going to learn in this verse is that the son is going to confess him before them. He's going to let them know these are mine. Um, let's go right just three chapters over to chapter 15, verse 10 in Luke. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner who repents. Which chapter right. are you in? Chapter 15, verse 10. <laughs> He's picking on him. <laughs> So the angels, he says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So it means that they're watching. Right. When a sinner repents, they rejoice. They're paying attention. When you or I turn from our sins, angels in heaven rejoice that we have repented, that we've turned. They're they're watching, they're following. Imagine what they do when we sin. Because if they rejoice when we repent, they cry. They grieve. They probably weep over our sins. The same as God is watching, his angels are also watching us. And I'm not saying that uh, every angel knows everything we do, because they don't. But the angels that are around us and, and what the Father, remember, the Father in heaven, if he wants all of his angels to know what Chris Walden has done, that Chris Walden has just repented, God can allow them to see what he sees, just like he can allow you and I to see what he sees. But we don't have the ability in and of ourselves to do that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Right? So they're limited like we're limited. But God allows them to go beyond their limitations, just like he allows us to go beyond our limitations. But we are reliant on the power of God to be able to do that. Like an angel interpreting a dream or any of those things, they're going beyond. They don't have that in and of themselves. They get that from God. Um, their, their ability to do all the things they do comes from God. So, okay, let's uh, go 1 Corinthians 4, 9. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession. Am I in the right place? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like men condemned to die in the arena, we have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. All right. So again, uh, Paul's talking about how they've been put on display. They're suffering and things as though they were in an arena, um, like the gladiators or something, right? And and there's crowds watching them. They say we've been put on display before men. And before angels. So again, angels are watching and angels are learning. In the same way that a, a human is sitting there watching Paul suffer for Christ, angels watch and they're learning. The demons watch and they're learning. So do the holy angels. So they they do gain and grow in knowledge. They don't have that knowledge. They don't see in the future. They don't see everything at one time like God does. God, ha God has never not been and, and he never not will be right that's a real great english way of putting it <laughs> he's always been right and he always will be so um that being the case god sees every point of our time he's outside of time angels are not outside of time god is outside of time um, he's the only being that's outside of time he created it um, he places himself within it um, to relate with his created beings but uh, he is outside of it because he has no beginning and he has no end right so uh, again great a great verse that shows that we are being watched uh, and and they are watching and they are learning they rejoice when we repent they watch when uh, we suffer and, and when we suffer for the gospel uh, we are a spectacle both before uh, angels and men I just looked up the word spectacle, and it's the Greek word theatron, where we get the word theater. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Good. A place in which games or dramatic spectacles are exhibited. A public show. 
Wow. Wow. Kind of reminds you of uh, what it says about the saints in he he Hebrews, where we are surrounded by the saints of Watson. Exactly. And I know there's different interpretations. I hear some that believe that the saints, Christians, are, can watch and see everything. Others would say, I don't think so, because they would be grieving in heaven's a place where there's no suffering or <laughs> tears. And they would be suffering with tears, right? So, um, yeah. So I, I uh, you know, you can go either way on that one if you want, however you see that. But I, I think that no matter what, we, we know the Bible is very clear we, repeatedly that the angels are watching and learning. And they're all around us. Uh, but in a spirit realm, uh, a spirit dimension. So and I know that's kind of hard for us to comprehend or imagine sometimes that there's a whole nother world of creatures created by God that are walking around on this planet in the grocery store with you, in the church with you, in your car with you. Everywhere you go, they go. They're in airplanes with you. There are good ones and there are evil ones, and they are everywhere, everywhere. You, you, you. They're not Almost so small in number that you know it. <laughs> you know, they're, you they're know that, that angel helped avoid that. I feel like yeah. There's that. times where we see there because of God giving them the assignment. There are times when they intervene and have protected. I think different ones of you have shared some of those incidents where you know Jerry shared his bicycle accident. He knows something protected him he should have been flattened and he was not and he got up and walked and was actually checking on the driver who hit him how does a man of his age on a thin little bike get hit from a car get up walk over and start asking the man who hit him are you okay <laughs> he believes an angel have to agree with him <laughs> i mean this was this was just a few years ago this was not you know when he was 50 or 40 i mean he's he got hit on a bike not too many <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Let's uh, go to Ephesians three ten. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. All right. I love this one. Uh, theologians, you know, I've read both ways here, and I think both could be true. Because I think, uh, though, if you read the Ephesians 6, 10, and following passage, it talks about the, uh, the armor of God and all. When it talks about, in fact, we're right here in Ephesians, let's turn over and look at it right quick. Um, we see them mentioning that our battle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This is verse 12. But against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. All right. So we have some of the very things mentioned here, mentioned there. And it is a in, in the Ephesians six part of this book. It's uh, it's directly talking about powers of the air that are wicked and evil warring against us. Evil forces in the heavenly realms. That are warring against us, right? So, uh, so it is. There's not any problem with saying that uh, he is displaying uh, his manifold wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God, uh, that he might show it and make it known through his church to these rulers, authorities, uh, and in the heavenly places. I think the easiest interpretation, the one that you would have a hard time arguing, isn't there, is that. The church is supposed to manifest the glory and the wisdom of God to all these fallen wicked angels, right? But I think there is also a possibility that there are also righteous angels uh, that are in the same types of positions. And I said this earlier when we were talking about it um, a few weeks back, that just like there are principalities and powers and rulers and such that are fallen angels i believe there are the exact same ranks that are righteous angels that are they are in charge of a state a city they are the angels of god the holy angels though um, i don't know how you can argue that the devil would be territorial and strategized to hold cities and such and god wouldn't have done it first because the devil is a copycat of god and uh and we saw if you remember a month or so back we talked about Daniel 
chapter 10 ish, where we, we talk about Michael being your angel. And we, we looked at in the context that he was talking about, he is Israel's angel, Daniel's people's angel, that he's over their nation. He's that the angel over the nation of Israel. Now, you know, that does take a little bit of speculation, but we've got a lot of evidence that helps us to get most of the way there. And so I think we've got some good, I think we've got enough that we could say it, that we're not just blindly making this up. We know that demons do because we've got the Prince of Greece, the Prince of Persia. These are spirits, principalities over nations. And we've got Michael who is the prince over Israel. Daniel's prince over. So, and it's right there in the same book, in the same context. And we're talking about how they're warring with each other, right? So that being the case, uh, it's possible that the church, let's go back to our little passage here in Ephesians 3. If angels longed to look into the things that we're walking in, right? Because they, it's not theirs, but they long to look into it. They don't have it automatically. We read that back here in 1 Peter. Uh, and if truly they rejoice when they see one repent, and if they're watching us uh, as we are spectacles on display, right? Along with men watching us and so on, angels are also watching. Um, God may very well be revealing and manifesting his glory through the church and they're watching uh, and it may be, I don't know if entertained is the right word, but they're rejoicing. They've got to be. They, what, what happened when Jesus was born? They, they exploded in worship before the shepherds, didn't they? Right. When, when God's kingdom is advancing, when, when his people are praying, when his church is living out the truth, you know the angels are rejoicing. Why? Well, because their side is winning. We're a part of their kingdom because they're a part of the kingdom of God and we're a part of the kingdom of God. We're all on the same side. All right. So they might be the Navy and we're the army, but we're all on the same team. OK, they may be different types of beings than we are all spirit beings, but they're not human. They're not children of Adam. They're not redeemed by the blood of the lamb. We are. If that were possible, then all the fallen demons and Satan could be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. But he didn't die for them. At least not anywhere we find in Scripture. He died for mankind. And we have the opportunity to turn from our sin, to repent and be saved. Um, angels, it does not appear anywhere that, they, that they're of the same classification that he died for them. So... Um, Let's, uh, any, any questions about how we, when we live out, uh, we, we manifest the wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God uh, to the authorities and the rulers and the heavenly places. That ought to make us all excited. Let's go out and share the gospel with people. Let's pray for our cities. Let's pray for the lost. Let's pray for sinners. Let's pray, pray, pray for the power of God, for the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven. Because the more we pray, the more of these angels are being sent by God who answers our prayers and responds by sending these forces, these holy forces to back us up. It's like calling in reinforcements. And I don't think we recognize that we live in a spiritual world. I think we, when we don't walk with God and we don't pray and we don't read the word very, very often, we really start to live as carnal beings only flesh and blood and the bible says that we do not we walk by faith and not by sight we walk by faith and not by sight but a lot of the church in our day and time we're guilty of walking much more by sight and much less by faith and you can't if you walk by sight you're not walking by faith but if you think about it if we start walking by faith we start recognizing my goodness we're losing here in america we're losing here in offering we're losing in our schools. Yeah. We need reinforcements. What kind of reinforcements? Well, can all of us go up in our schools and stand there and tell kids, you don't need to cuss anymore. Stop telling that filthy joke. Hey, you need to get out of that sexual relationship. Can we do that? Stop. No, you shouldn't lie. Don't be stealing that guy's we pencil. Can try. We, can, yeah, we can try. They're going to kick us out. They won't ever let us in the doors. But how do we, we need to be praying. how does our kingdom enter into that school? How does our kingdom enter in? Well, there's a covert force. 
that God can send. All we've got to do is radio to the commander in chief. He makes the call. But we radio in. Father, we've got a problem here. Right. We've got a problem here. We're going to see the power of these angelic beings as we keep going. We're going to watch what they do. What they can do when God sends them. We don't get to tell an angel to come. We ask the Father and He sends them. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, let's go now to Galatians uh, 3.19. This is a little bit of what... Um, was being mentioned earlier. Uh, One book back. Kathy was talking about the angel interpreting the dream for Daniel. And this is a little bit of what that subject is, how they can convey revelation. Chapter 3, verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through the angels by the hand of a mediator. Of a mediator. <laughs> Is it just through 19? Yeah, that's fine. So well, the part we're pulling out is about the angels here. Uh, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, which are sins, having been ordained through angels. Right? So angels are the ones who brought that revelation. Where did the law come from? It comes from God. But God says he sent it down to us through angels. Right? That's what we get here. Is that God is the one who sent it down. He, he conveyed it, that revelation to us uh, through the angels. He ordained it through angels uh, by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. And that's speaking of Christ. And then it says, Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's, uh, I, I kind of made a little note here uh, because we've been talking about knowledge and their superhuman knowledge and their limited nature of knowledge, how they find out things, how they grow in knowledge and they literally are watching us. Uh, but their knowledge is not an all-knowing. They're not omniscient, right? Um, in the same way, uh, we're about to go into their power now. They have great and superhuman power, but they are not all powerful. They're not omnipotent, all right? Um, this is taught in three different ways in Scripture. One is by the titles that are given them, principalities, powers, authorities, dominions, thrones. This shows that they have power and authority just by every one of these words is a power word, isn't it? A principality, a power, an authority, dominion, thrones. Every one of these are terms that uh, are titles of power and authority, aren't they? And then, so by the very titles that are given in Scripture, both holy angels and unholy angels, we know that they have great and superhuman power. Okay? So we know it by their titles, but we also know it by direct assertions. So let's go to 2 Peter 2.11. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. Amen. But, but because that I, I should have had you read back earlier, um, start right above that in uh, trying to see where you can get the actual because it's talking about a subject. It'd be good for everybody to know the subject it's talking about. Um, why don't you begin? In verse 6 and just read down. We'll finish up what he was talking about until he moves into that. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burying them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who is distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for the righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deed he saw and heard. 
If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from the trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Celestial beings, yeah, that's what angelic means. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. Amen. So, he's talking about wicked men and their arrogance. That's kind of the context. That's why I asked Bubba to go back and read that. And he, what he does is he says, these arrogant men, they walk in such pride, arrogance, they don't even know what they're doing. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. They don't tremble, and they should. So we're talking about how powerful these beings are. He says, this is how foolish some men are. Some men are so foolish, they don't tremble when they speak against these powerful angelic majesties. These things could squash and kill them in a heartbeat, and they have no fear and trembling of them. And he says, here's how powerful they are. Even the angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. Even other angels don't do what men do. And it's saying that these angels are greater in power than man. That's what he's saying. They are greater in might and power than man, and yet they don't bring these accusations against these angelic majesties, right? But these corrupt men do. And sometimes I think about um, even, I think we should be careful as Christians, uh, and I know even my mentors have taught on this for years because they've learned some hard lessons that, just because you're a son or daughter of God and you've got the Spirit of God inside of you does not give you the assignment to go after a principality over your city. Mm. You should not think that you are that. Wow. <laughs> now, here's something that you should understand. If God gives you the assignment, then you have the authority mm. and you can bind a principality over Dallas because God gave you the assignment. God's exactly. He's going to have one angel bind the devil. Mm -hmm. With just a chain and a key. With one angel, and he'll do it. Mm -hmm. How come one angel is going to be able to bind the most powerful fallen angel that exists? Because God gave one angel the authority. Yeah. And that's all it takes. Yeah. So I have a question. What about our own, and I know it obviously it's, it's not quite as big as Dallas, but what about my own home? Because I go through and I, I right. keep stuff out of my house all the time. Right. There's we're dealing with different levels, and that's the thing to remember. Uh, what's in your house is going to be a much smaller level demon, unless you are involved in a cult and witchcraft, and you're bringing in some very powerful things. Um, in which case, you would probably want a few believers to come in and confess and and things. But um, but taking on a city, a principality over a city, even as small as Aubrey. Um, unless God gives you the assignment, you could lead yourself into it. It would be what, what Eddie and Al Smith have likened it to is uh, going up and striking a hornet's nest. OK, mm -hmm. you you don't have the authority Angry or man. the power to kill them. Mm -hmm. You're going to go and just stir them up and, and they're going to attack you. Oh, wow. Right. So you don't. And in fact, Alva Smith did this when she she prayed and prayed and prayed for God to give her the name of the principality over Houston. This was back in the 80s. And so after, I think, a year or two of her praying for God to give her the name of the principality, God gave it to her. So she went out, and man, she's a little thing, bold as a lion, mm -hmm. and started binding and speaking against the principality, and she got others with her, and <laughs> they're gonna bind the principality over Houston, and they did it. Wow. And then her life for multiple years was just being pummeled financially wow. in every way. She was being just, just beaten, beaten, beaten. And she was crying out to God for another several years. Why, God, 
Why? Why are you letting all this happen to me? And he said, sometimes a lesson from God takes quite a long time to learn. <laughs> he said, you ask for its name, but I never gave you the assignment. Wow. If you don't have the assignment from God, you don't go after what you don't have the assignment to go after. Because you're mm -hmm. stepping into something that you have no business stepping into. Mm -hmm. God is going to bind the devil one day. Amen. But he has not yet. He has not yet. He and will bind him one day. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. I remember you telling me a story about Eddie at a conference um, saying something to the effect of, you know, I bet a bunch of you guys in here, you want to bind the devil. Yeah. Don't you? And they, everybody start roaring and getting really excited, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And then he said, we'll do it. Yeah. 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 So he's standing at an enormous Assemblies of God conference. And he stands up and he says, how many of you want to bind the devil? And they go crazy. And he goes, then somebody do it. Because I'm sick and tired of what he's doing to <laughs> my kids, my grandkids, and this world. And then he said the house got and that's how he began his teaching. That's the way Eddie works. <laughs> <laughs> he's either going to get thrown out of the conference or he's going to help you learn something. <laughs> but yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, yeah, Mark. No one really has the authority to do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that what, he was, scale, what he was teaching, exactly. What he was teaching was until God gives the assignment, you're not, you don't go bind the devil. Right. Now, when Mark and I was praying for a man recently who had a lot of demonic activity in him and because the scripture says so when a demon began to manifest and was talking over us and was cursing Jesus and whatever else they were doing yes we would take authority and, and say I bind you you're going to be silent and it would stop immediately wow. mm -hmm. but we're dealing with a much lower level right. demon we're not dealing with the principality and so when you see in this verse majesties you're dealing with a term that is like principalities, powers, authorities. This is a very different realm. You don't take these things on and you definitely don't take on anything that God hasn't given you an assignment to do. But in the scripture, we have been given authority to cast out demons in people. We have been, but even then, um, all of that is relying on a lot of things. I can't walk up to just anybody and make anything go. You might think, well, Chris, yes, you can. That's what the Bible says, you don't have faith. There's a whole lot more to casting the spirit out than just walking up and saying in Jesus name. There's the person's heart, the sin they're hiding, the entry points, the trauma. Have they forgiven people they need to forgive? There's a ton load of stuff that can allow a demon spirit to stay in a person's life. No matter how much you say Jesus name, it doesn't matter. So there's a, there's a lot involved in someone getting free and a lot involved in a spirit of darkness doing what you tell it to do. But when everything lines up, and, the, and, and it's the will of God, and remember this too. These are things we've got to remember all of Scripture. Paul says, a thorn was given to me in my flesh, and, and, and it was a messenger of Satan. Yeah. Oh. And he said, three times I asked God to take it away, and he said, no. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. I'm going to let that messenger of Satan stay in you to torment you because it keeps you humble. There are times God allows things to stay in us that aren't holy, but he allows it to stay because he has a purpose. And every purpose of God is a good purpose. So again, I don't have carte blanche to make anything and everything go. And even if God wants everything to go in a certain individual, he may not want everything to go on that day because that person may not have enough biblical truth in them to maintain the ground that would be gained. That comes out of scripture. If you, if you drive out every spirit of darkness and they only have a little bit of truth inside of them, those spirits are going to come back and be a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God will make a little go, but there's still more to go. And it may be a few years before that person has built up enough truth and understanding and relationship with God to be able to maintain a whole other level of freedom from those things. And, and it's, it's about growing in the faith. My goodness, I've talked away our hour. Now, um, this is kind of a little off, but I... Don't you think it's funny that during the election, the the name of the software or voting the software that they put or in Dominion. place was called Dominion? Yeah. I felt like that just immediately yeah. made me feel like that was something from the devil. Yeah. I, I, 
I don't know, like power over us. I mean, yeah. you know, like, and do they have authority to have power over us? Yeah. Is it because, I mean,